Well, I want to thank everybody for being here. I want to thank uh, Chancellor. Th Chancellor, thank you for being a part of this. Uh, Dr. Zerwas, uh, Chief Nimkid, and Dr. Hellerstedt, who are part of our team, and their leadership is very much appreciated. I do want to start out today by expressing my heartfelt and deep gratitude for everybody in the medical profession, doctor, nurse, assistant, uh, whatever role you play. The role that our medical professionals are playing is pivotal as we continue to fight back against COVID-19 in the state of Texas. We're engaged in a war against this infectious disease. And the warriors on the front line of fighting that battle are those who are the health care providers, and we cannot thank them enough for what they are doing. One reason why we are here today is to provide good news for those frontline health care workers as well as good news for everybody in Lubbock and across the entire state of Texas. The good news is this, and that is the first medical treatment that has been made for COVID-19 has now arrived. It has now arrived in Lubbock, has also arrived across the state of Texas. It is the Eli Lilly antibody therapeutic treatment. It's like the drug that was taken by the president uh, that helped him recover so quickly from COVID-19. Its best use is for the early stage of COVID cases in patients who were in the, the early iterations of COVID-19. And the goal is to give it to them at such an early date that it will keep them out of hospitals. And that will be one of the strategies used to make sure that we are able to reduce hospitalizations, whether it be in Lubbock or any place in the state of Texas. And so that's the goal. The goal is to both heal Texans as well as to ease the burden on hospitals in Lubbock and elsewhere in just the coming weeks. Uh, what we have with us here today are a couple of charts that show you exactly what we're talking about when we talk about this Eli Lilly therapeutic drug. This is a, uh, a, a closer-up model, and it shows you both what it looks like and how it works. On, on the left-hand side is, is a bag that contains uh, the antibody therapeutic. Uh, in that uh, liquid bag, it takes an hour for that liquid bag uh, to be uh, in, uh, infused just like uh, a drip uh, in, in a patient. Uh, you can see the, the drip stand that looks like any other type of drip that you would see in any type of hospital setting. Uh, and all it takes is one hour, and then the treatment is complete. And so this is something uh, that is going to be uh, increasing meaningfully both here in Lubbock and around the state. So Lubbock has already received its first allocation of this drug. There will be additional allocations made on a weekly basis that will continue to add to uh, the current allocation. And these weekly supplies will, will continue, especially uh, when you put into context the, all of the medical resources uh, that are being harnessed and being brought to the table. Because in addition to this Eli Lilly uh, antibody therapeutic drug, we do anticipate uh, beginning to get the clearance for and then the receipt of uh, the uh, antibody therapeutic drug made by Regeneron, which was the manufacturer of the drug uh, that was taken by the president that provides the same type of treatment that Eli Lilly uh, drug is providing. And then that will be added to uh, in, in, the, in the coming weeks uh, by even more, uh, more that will help treat people who have COVID and more that will prevent people from getting COVID. Because the more good news is that over the course of December, we are anticipating more treatments, but also we are anticipating two vaccines to be approved in December, one by Pfizer and the other by Moderna. And there could be more than that, but both Pfizer and Moderna have shown an effective rate of 95%. That's an extremely high effectiveness rate for a vaccine. And we, we, as in the state of Texas, are already prepared structurally for the quick distribution of those vaccines once they are approved. This is a process that the governors of the United States have worked in collaboration with the White House on to make sure that we were 
fully prepared to distribute these vaccines across the country and across the state as quickly as possible once they arrive. And again, we are expecting the arrival of those vaccines sometime in December. So in addition to the medicines uh, that we are providing uh, to the Lubbock area, uh, with the help of Chief Kidd, as well as uh, everybody involved uh, in, in all the different organizations in the state of Texas. Uh, the state has provided Lubbock with 327 medical personnel currently working in Lubbock, 950 personnel currently working to support Lubbock and Amarillo, and 1,278 personnel approved to support Lubbock and Amarillo if needed. In addition to that, uh, we have added uh, increased supplies for PPE, including over 1.1 million masks uh, and hundreds of thousands of coveralls and gowns. Uh, in addition to that, we've set up auxiliary medical units uh, with bed capacities at Covenant Hospital at the University Medical Center. Uh, and so these auxiliary units uh, may be some of the locations that will be used to deliver uh, these antibody therapeutic drugs. And in addition to all of that, uh, we have set up testing sites, uh, COVID testing sites uh, in Lubbock. There are three testing sites open from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. daily uh, to make sure that people are going to be able to gain access to the testing they need to, to learn whether or not uh, they may or may not have COVID. While we wait, for increased volumes of these antibody therapeutic drugs as well as the vaccines is important for everybody to remember the habits that got us through the spike of cases of COVID-19 in July. Everyone knows that we have an increase in COVID-19 in Texas right now, but everybody also knows this is not our first response to this challenge. There was uh, an even greater increase in COVID-19 cases, a greater increase in hospitalizations in July. And we learned at that time exactly what needed to be done in order to crush the spread of COVID-19 in Texas. And Texans joined in together to make sure that we did slow the spread. And it's going back to those very same simple habits. You will not get COVID if you do not expose yourself to COVID. You can prevent yourself from being exposed to COVID if, if you keep your distance from others, uh, if you stay indoors if at all possible, uh, if you wear a mask if you do go out, if you sanitize your hands frequently. And so these very common practices were perfected by Texans that led to the crush of COVID over the course of late August and through the month of September. We've been there before. We can do it again. All we need uh, is for people in the Lubbock area uh, and across the entire state of Texas to return to those safe practices that we learned over the course of the summer. And then just one larger concept, and that is it's so easy to let our guard down, thinking that maybe COVID-19 has passed. And all we need to do is to bring that guard back up. And if we do that, we will get through this episode just as we got through the episode uh, during the months of July uh, in August. So with that being said, I am now going to pass it to Chief Nimkit. Thank you, Governor. And I also want to thank Chancellor Mitchell and his team, not only here in Lubbock, but for the work that they're doing across the state. I think the Chancellor might mention that in his remarks here in a minute, but uh, a wide impact from our higher education systems that are out there. The healthcare workers that have been in this fight for months, uh, I thank you. I want you to keep your faith, keep your strength, and keep working. We're not out of this yet, but y'all are doing some amazing work out there. I, I want to thank all of our first responders, Governor. We, we've changed the way that we do business on the, on the streets in the state of Texas and across the nation because first responders have to presume every person they come in contact with is COVID positive until proven otherwise. I, I'm very excited about the announcements today. I'm very excited about the advancements in healthcare the drugs that are coming out, they will make a difference, but they still are not a, an excuse not to follow the recommendations of our public health partners. Just because you have a seatbelt in your car does not mean you should speed and drive reckless. Just because we are going to see these pharmaceuticals and therapeutics come out that are going to make it better does not mean we should be reckless in our behavior. And finally, we will continue to support our local partners with personal protective equipment, with testing supplies, there are over, I just looked, there are 42 locations within a 15-mile radius of where I'm sitting right now that you can go get a COVID-19 test. 
There's over 2,200 across the state of Texas right now that are ready to go test if you think you're positive. So please do that. And then uh, finally, as, as we start seeing our universities break and kids go back home to their families, be careful. Be careful on what you do. Don't be a turkey. It, it's time to, to follow the rules still, even though you're leaving campus. And with that, Governor, I think we'll turn it to Dr. Hellerstadt. Doctor. Thank you, Chief Chang. Thank you, Governor. I'm John Hellerstadt. I'm the Commissioner for the Texas Department of State Health Services. And I do want to thank the uh, elected leaders and the leadership of the healthcare community here in, in the Lombok area for uh, sitting down with us. It was an extremely uh, useful and I think productive uh, conversation that we had, especially about ways to uh, optimize and maximize the use of this uh, new uh, infused antibody, uh, anti-COVID antibody uh, therapy. I, I would want to remind people it's very, very promising, but it's not magical. Uh, it uh, still has to be given uh, to the right group of people at the right time, and uh, over time it will decrease the number of people who need to be in the hospital. That's, that's really very important, and we want to target uh, the uh, administration of that to areas like Lubbock and other parts of the state that are experiencing a, a really scary surge in the amount of uh, hospitalized patients that they have. But again, the, the conversation that we have about the very innovative ways that the uh, uh, hospitals uh, in Lubbock area and the healthcare leaders in the Lubbock area are going to be innovative and, and get it to as many people as qualify as possible is really great. Um, others have said it before, I'll say it again, uh, as a pediatrician and as the chief health officer, public health officer for the state, I have three priorities when it comes uh, to uh, COVID-19. It's prevention, prevention, prevention. Now, these new drugs are, if you will, sort of a form of secondary prevention. They're, they're a way of trying to prevent people from ending up in the hospital. But by far the most important thing are the primary uh, ways to prevent it, which, we, we, which we've outlined here. So if you're physically separated from someone, you're just out of range of COVID, you're going to help to protect yourself from getting it. But the, the masks that we wear is another way of shortening, if you will, limiting the range of, of the secretions that we all uh, 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 transmit when we speak and talk. And we, we know that lots of people who don't have any symptoms of COVID are responsible for the spread. Uh, and so wearing the mask uh, when you're around folks uh, that are not part of your uh, uh, own household is the most important thing that we can do. And I really want to urge people to do that. The hand washing, the personal hygiene, the disinfecting, that's all important too. But number one is mask. And, and if uh, the viewers at home could look around this room, they would see, except for the people who are speaking in the microphone, everybody's got a mask on that. And that is excellent behavior. That, that really helps. So we have some very promising things in the future. Uh, we've got this uh, monoclonal antibody. Uh, we have vaccines coming on the way. But this is a marathon, and we're not at the finish line yet. And until we get to that point where we have uh, really effective vaccines that are widely available, really effective therapeutics that are widely available, we're going to need to stick to those basics of prevention that I just outlined. So thank you. Thank you, Doctor. Well, thank you, Governor, and uh, Chancellor Mitchell, thank you again for your hospitality. Chancellor Milliken sends his regards. So, uh, But um, I, I, I want to just build on some of the commentary that we, we've heard here, and that is uh, despite the fact that we are making great progress in the treatment of this disease, we are continuing to see a surge on hospital beds, and um, the innovation and the dedication of the personnel that are treating these people is the testimony to our success so far. Uh, but if we look at where we've come, I you know it's kind of like building a plane in the air. We know some things that work, some things that don't work. Uh, but we've discovered that, you know, you know, Decadron is a great drug to use when we're getting towards uh, the more serious parts of this disease. Uh, we know that remdesivir, which came along also during some of this surge and some of this activity, is a useful drug when you're a little more sick. Now we have something in the Eli Lilly monoclonal antibody and the Regeneron product that will probably come out in the near future 
that can actually get ahead even further uh, before people are actually needing oxygen or something like that. That's the exciting thing that's happening right now. It's truly a, a groundbreaking accomplishment that we've been able to, you know, generate these types of antibodies to serve as kind of a bridge for people so that they have something before the vaccine is available. And then, of course, all the excitement around the vaccine is out there also. Um, but here and now, what we're dealing with is, is, is a contagion that has obviously some extraordinary impact on people. The vast majority of us are still uh, susceptible to this disease, despite the amount of infection that we've had, the number of people that have been treated. Think about the number of people that are asymptomatic that have never even been tested and, and required any treatment. But the vast majority of the population of the state of Texas is still susceptible. And so I'll end on the same note that you've heard everybody else end on. Uh, our vaccine, in the meantime, is this mask. And the more we wear this mask, the more we protect ourselves and the more we protect others. And uh, I look forward to the day that we don't have to be wearing these masks. I can see the light at the end of the tunnel on that. I'm excited about that. But in the meantime, John Zarwas is going to be wearing this mask. So thank you. Thank you, Governor. Sure. Thank you, Dr. Chancellor. Thank you, Governor. Uh, listening to what Dr. Zerwas just said, I'm, I'm reminded, I'm par I'll paraphrase Winston Churchill when he said, this is not the beginning of the end, but it is the end of the beginning. And there is light at the end of the tunnel. And this new monoclonal antibody is very promising for people that are in particular risk groups. And uh, I think that if you look at what we're trying to do collectively, our top priority is to take care of each other. That's to take care of folks that could get sick from this, that's to do everything we can to mitigate the spread of the virus. And that's to take care of the health care personnel that at this point in time are just exhausted. Everybody. We're all sick and tired of, of putting on masks and the like. And there, there is help on the way. There is help coming. This is uh, a tremendous uh, shot in the arm from the governor's office with this help. Governor, we're very appreciative of everything you have done. Chief Kidd, everything you guys have done to help this along has been remarkably effective, not just this, but everything up until now. And so uh, if you look at the, the Texas Tech University system, uh, because we do have two health-related universities within our system, we have great uh, relationships with our hospital partners around West Texas. And so from the Panhandle uh, down to the Permian Basin, from Abilene out to El Paso, we're here to help. And we've got people that are working 24-7 for this, and this is a, a tremendous new chapter in being able to, to, to bend that curve so that eventually we can be out of the masks. But again, I'll, I'll, I'll finish with what everybody else said. Until then, the best treatment is prevention. So, Governor, thank you again for coming out and making the trip to do this. Sure. Thank you. Uh, very quickly, next steps are these, and, and that is uh, what we talked about in a private meeting before coming out are the strategies that all of the local hospitals in the Lubbock region will be using uh, to most quickly deploy uh, and administer uh, this new antibody therapy. The first step is to identify those who would be most likely to qualify for this. If you don't have COVID, you wouldn't qualify. Uh, if you're late stage in uh, having COVID, you wouldn't qualify. Uh, there are certain metrics that were provided by uh, the United States Department of Health and Human Services that these doctors have, uh, the Chancellor has, and as well as the other doctors uh, behind me have, that one thing I want them to do is to provide to local TV stations uh, what the qualifying factors are. Typically, it's those who are 65 and older uh, with some uh, other health care based issue uh, and early stage COVID. And then we are also reaching out to nursing homes. A lot of the people in nursing homes uh, would automatically qualify for this uh, to make sure that uh, anybody in a nursing home uh, who gets COVID and is in early stage of it, uh, they will have, have access to this therapeutic drug. And then the logistics of it, and that is uh, a lot of these hospitals, uh, they will e either be able to administer it internally at the hospital or they have ancillary facilities outside their hospital but adjacent to it that they will be able to administer it or through a mobile ambulance unit or in a nursing home setting. And so they, they are working on finalizing all these strategies. But I know that they will be reaching out to the public because we need the public to understand that you may qualify for this therapy that can both help your health 
but also help reduce the possibility of you needing to go to the hospital. And so I believe that local officials will be working to assemble uh, a way uh, to establish a portal or some other strategy to receive information about possible candidates in this region for this medication so that we can begin to administer it as quickly as, as possible so that we can begin that process of reducing hospitalizations in the Lubbock area as well as across the state of Texas. We'll be happy to take a few questions. We'll start left and go right. Yes, and then come to you next. Thank you, sir. Um, how many treatments are available here in Lubbock, and how quickly will they be distributed to other West Texas regions, uh, Odessa, uh, Midland area in particular? So they, they are being distributed to all regions in the state of Texas as we speak. Uh, the, there are allocations that are made. The first allocation that is made is by the federal government about which states are going to be receiving the drug. Uh, Texas ranked number two among the states receiving the drug. The one that ranked number one was Illinois. They got just a few more than Texas did uh, based upon the first two allocations. And then Texas allocates it around the state of Texas based upon what the hospital needs are in those particular regions. We, our, our most immediate goal uh, is to reduce uh, the uh, lack of capacity at hospitals. And as a result, uh, Lubbock, uh, the Emerald area, the Midland area, the El Paso area, uh, all fall within the zones that we are working to focus on uh, to make sure that they will be receiving as much as possible. The, the amount is added on a weekly basis. And so there's ongoing supplies, uh, and it's not a one-day shipping. Uh, it's a daily shipping of supplies uh, that are coming in. And so it just comes in on a daily basis. But uh, they have a, a, enough right now where they can begin the process uh, and be able to, to treat a volume of patients for at least several days, at which time there will be more supplies coming in. Yes. Sure. So the question is, what are the risks about this? And I think it would be best for a doctor to answer that question. Uh, so I will. Uh, which which doctor wants to step up and answer that question? Um, there, this is a, a monoclonal antibody product. It is infused intravenously, and so uh, people can have what are known as infusion reactions to things that that go in. Also, there's a, a risk with any kind of medication, especially, again, if it's infused directly into the body, of a, a very severe allergic reaction that we call anaphylaxis. The incidence of both of those is low with this, uh, with this drug. It's very safe, but it's not zero. And so that's one of the reasons we want to make sure that when it's administered, it's done in a setting where if any kind of emergency, any kind of adverse reaction took place, uh, the personnel and the, and the setting would be equipped to uh, deal with that reaction. Anything further? Yeah. All right. Other questions? Yes. Um, I, I'm Sarah Salt Hall, working with the Lodic NPR station. I'll echo what Dr. Mitchell said. Thank you for what you have done for Lodic. Um, we desperately need it, so thank you for sending the help that sure. you have. Uh, local leaders across the state have expressed wanting to do more to mitigate the spread in their communities. Um, locally, we have a petition going around asking for more of that as well. Um, but you said that another shutdown is not coming and that the protocols in place from the state work when they're enforced. Texas is a big state with diverse needs at this point and why not give city and county authorities more flexibility to do what they can for their community? First, it is important for everybody in the state to know that uh, statewide we're not going to have another shutdown and there's various reasons for that. Uh, one is uh, there are it, there's an overestimation of exactly what a shutdown will achieve, and there is an un, a misunderstanding of, about what a shutdown will not achieve. Uh, if, if you lock people down and try to prevent any movement whatsoever, uh, there are now known uh, severe uh, medical consequences of that emotional, uh, mental type consequences to it, as well as uh, the devastating financial consequences. Lesser known, however, is the ineffectiveness of it because one thing that we've learned over the course of COVID uh, is one of the most common ways that COVID is spread today is n not by someone going to work, but by people gathering together 
in home settings or in casual settings uh, after bars close or something like that. Uh, and so shutdowns will not lead to the positive results that some people think. With regard to local authorities, there are plenty of tools in the toolboxes of local authorities to achieve the results that are needed. If you go back to my, my last executive order that provided what the protocols and centers were if hospitalizations increased above a threshold level in a particular region, it provided additional tools such as closing down bar settings, such as reducing occupancy capacity, uh, and other tools that local officials do have. What I have found and what I found, for example, in El Paso, when I talked to the county judge in El Paso, I said, you need to enforce the protocols. And he said that he, he couldn't or he didn't feel like he could just because of the, the challenge and complication of it. Uh, and what that means is some local officials are not using the tools that are available to them to make sure that they are taking every step they need. So just giving more tools won't mean anything. So here's the point. And that is, the, these measurable tools or metrics won't matter if they're not enforced. And they need to be enforcing the protocols that are in place right now. Those were designed in part by recommendations of doctors. If those current protocols are followed, it will lead to a reduction in the spread of COVID-19. Yes. So the, the CARES Act funding is handled different based upon different jurisdictions. Uh, there are certain large cities, you know, I know part of your, your viewing area may be, let's say, El Paso, in, in which case El Paso got their own CARES Act funding. And with regard to, to any city or county of less than 500,000, the CARES Act funding for them went through the state of Texas. The way the state of Texas handled that is uh, there were committees established to determine what the allocations were going to be. And those were committees led uh, on the Senate side by the Lieutenant Governor, uh, the Chair of Senate Finance, the Vice Chair of Senate Finance, as well as other members uh, of the Senate Finance Committee, and uh, the Speaker of the House, uh, the Chair of House Appropriations, the Vice Chair of House Appropriations, as well as other members of the House Appropriations Committee. Working collaboratively amongst all those people, uh, they decided uh, the way that the money would be um, uh, provided to communities across the state of Texas. A reason, I believe, uh, why that money has not been fully dispersed yet is because of what we are going through right now. What we're going through right now in Lubbock, for example, uh, is an acceleration of the spread of COVID-19 leading to an acceleration of the need for the state and local governments to spend CARES Act funding for, for all those medical personnel that I talked about earlier that are surging to this region. Uh, it, there, it requires money for us to be able to get the medical supplies, the PPE, uh, as well as uh, the doctors and nurses uh, and extra facilities like these uh, mobile medical units. And so that CARES Act funding is being used in this response that you're seeing in Lubbock, Texas right now, the response that you're seeing in El Paso, Texas right now, et cetera. And we wanted to make sure that that money would be available and not spent early on and not have access to it now to, for us to be able to respond to the medical needs that exist right now and will exist through the remainder of the year. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Welcome back to Lubbock. Thank you. Chief did just say earlier, just because this drug will be available soon does not mean we should be reckless. I asked our mayor this yesterday, why do you think people are just not wearing masks and not following those CDC guidelines? Why do you think that? Listen, there's COVID fatigue. There's no doubt about it. It's, it's understandable. We've, we're almost nine months uh, into the situation right now. So one reason is COVID fatigue. An another reason is uh, there sometimes is a perception that a, a person uh, will not get it. We're talking about something that's, that's invisible. When you're driving around, driving on a highway, you see a whole bunch of fast-moving cars, you can see, see, visually see that danger on the roadway that could occur uh, if you drive recklessly. This invisible disease, no one can see, and so they cannot see the danger that could be oncoming to them. Uh, and as a result, it's easy 
for people to let down their guard. I'll give you an easy example that leads to a big spreading event. And that is if, if, if people go into a group of strangers, they perceive there may be a greater danger out there because they don't know those strangers. They don't know if they do or do not have COVID-19. However, when people gather with family and friends, they let down their guard thinking, well, this is family and friends. I'm not going to get it from my family and friends. And it's turned out to be the case across Texas that people do get it frequently from family and friends. And so it's just one of those things where for a little while longer, as we continue to bring forward uh, in greater volume uh, additional drugs and medications and vaccines uh, as we begin to cure people and prevent people from getting COVID-19, it's important, as these doctors have made clear, that people continue to use the best safe practices so they can prevent themselves from exposing themselves to COVID-19. Yes. Thank you. So one of the best, there are several things about this, but one of the, one of the coming solutions is this antibody therapeutic drug. The, the, the goal of this drug is to keep people out of hospitals. And this drug is being provided to uh, the rural hospitals as, as well as to the urban hospitals. And so this will be an aid that should lead to a reduction of people being hospitalized. Uh, separate from that, we do have, uh, whether it be through Chief Kidd or Department of State Health Services, uh, these strategies to make sure that we will be able to go to the local rural setting and assist those there. And then the third alternative is, is exactly what you mentioned. We want to make sure that there is hospital capacity in the more urban type setting so that if a person in a rural setting does need a transfer to the urban setting, they will have the ability to do so. Yes, sir. How do you, ide um, thank you, Governor. How do you ideally uh, see the distribution of this treatment uh, within communities that have hospitals that are stretched absolutely thin right now without overloading the staff um, with a, another process? So, uh, in the, the way that we talked about it internally, and the way that we're, we're, the meeting before we came out here, and what we're seeing in a location like El Paso. So, in, in El Paso, there is an alternative care facility that's been set up, uh, which has about 100 hospital beds, uh, and we, we, where st uh, staffing from the outside is being provided for that for the purpose of administering this therapeutic drug. The same thing applies here in Lubbock with regard to these uh, auxiliary mobile units uh, that pro they have their own beds, uh, their staffing of those beds for the purpose of administering uh, this therapeutic antibody drug. And so, Typically, a, a good setting for it would be that independent type setting. Similarly, you'll, you'll have a nursing home type setting where you, you already have the room, you already have the bed, you already have uh, all, all of the equipment needed for the administration of the drug except for the drug itself, which can be provided to them. Uh, as Dr. Hellestet was making reference to it, it would be a better strategy to make sure that you do have a qualified medical staffing personnel at a nursing home to be able to both administer the drug, but also to respond uh, in case there is an adverse response to that drug. Yes, sir. Andrew Wood, Pop 34. Um, the large indoor gatherings, I mean, what Peter says, especially like luncheons, dinners, High school basketball games coming up? Yeah. And so, th th listen, this, this is a, a, a typical example of what we see about how communities self regulate and self respond to an increase in COVID 19. Uh, I've seen stories across the entire state of Texas uh, about college football games being canceled this weekend uh, because of COVID challenges. I've seen stories across the state of Texas about high school football games being canceled week after week after week. I've seen stories about schools closing and returning to remote learning. And so it just depends on the type of setting where we are seeing uh, a reduction of indoor and or outdoor activities because of that self-regulation and the decision making at the local level about ways to curtail activities to slow the spread of COVID or not to expose people to COVID. Yes. I'm asking a follow-up. Can you give an example of a 
of the city or county that is enforcing statewide mandates well without adding extras? That is enforcing it? Yes. I mean, we, we uh, I, I see more examples of, of people and in, in leaders in, in communities uh, that are stepping up and encouraging people and, and getting compliance. I, I can't, I haven't seen a whole lot of quote enforcement. Most enforcement that we see uh, is done by TABC. I will tell you that we have worked closely with uh, the mayor of Lubbock, uh, with Mayor Pope, and uh, he's been a good partner with the state of Texas, and we are partnering with him right now uh, to make sure that everyone uh, understands what the rules are, uh, understands the compliance that's required, and understand what the consequences will be for failure to comply. Yes. So as we go into the holidays and Thanksgiving, and, and people, again, need just to be personally responsible to make sure that they do not put themselves into a situation in which they can either get COVID or expose others to COVID. Uh, and, but they should know uh, that, listen, the, the cavalry is coming as, as it concerns COVID-19. There has been no meaningful medical defense or response to COVID-19 for the purpose of treating COVID-19 until the announcement of this drug that was created. People need to understand how consequential this is. I think this is the fastest that medications have been developed on mass scale to treat an infectious disease like this. Typically, it would take years to achieve what's been done in just over a half a year. And so we have uh, the Eli Lilly therapeutic drug that we're distributing in Lubbock today, uh, soon to come the Regeneron antibody therapeutic drug, and then soon to come after that uh, in December before Christmas time uh, would be uh, these uh, immunizations, the vaccines that will be coming uh, that will begin to prevent people from getting COVID-19. So uh, as we go into the holidays, I think people need to be thankful for the, the way that the genius of uh, the, the medical leaders in this country and the medical innovators in this country have been able to so quickly respond uh, with the medicines that are needed to make sure that soon we will be able to put COVID behind us. Two more questions. Got, got three hands up. One who hasn't asked a question, we'll go with him. So it'll take several days before you, you see the relief because uh, it'll take uh, several days to get it fully implemented, several days to get uh, a large number of people uh, who have received uh, these antibodies. And then you, you will see that some of those people who took those antibodies, uh, they will not need to be going into a hospital who otherwise may have needed to go into a hospital had they not received it. And so here's what it should mean, and that is uh, the future number of people going to hospitals should be on the decline going forward with the receipt of this drug. Last question. You've, done, you've had a couple. She had one, I think. We'll give it to her. Sure. So we, w one thing that we've learned as we've worked our way through the response to COVID-19, and that is we don't have to have an either-or situation. Either businesses are open or businesses are closed. Uh, we don't have to choose between uh, protecting people's lives or ending people's livelihoods. Uh, we can have both. And so uh, we've learned that there are safe ways and safe practices that businesses can operate. Part of those safe ways and practices are contained in the protocols that exist, and that's exactly why local officials need to enforce those protocols, because if those protocols are followed, it will ensure that those businesses will be able to remain open, knowing that the spread of COVID-19 will be contained as much as possible. Thank you all very much.